we've seen that also our model is dynamic. Um, what happens is that uh, consumption for household is going to jump. You know, it's given by another equation, but consumption is going to jump directly to its uh, to the critical point of the other equation. So uh, consumption is going to jump some level and stay there uh, forever. So the transition uh, of the of the model is going to be immediate to to one you know to its to its uh, solution. So although the model can be described by a dynamical system, it's going to jump directly to the critical point of the dynamical system. Um, and so that's going to so it means that basically we just have to solve the model uh, as if it was a static model. We'll have a set of static uh, equations to solve and the solution method is going to be very similar to what we did in the basic model, which was static. So we're going to uh, solve for tightness, uh, market tightness first, using an aggregate demand and an aggregate supply curve. And then once we have tightness, we'll be able to back out the value of all the other variables in the model. Um, so first step is to write down the aggregate demand curve, because we've already written down the aggregate supply curve. So the aggregate demand curve is going to give the amount of output that's demanded by households, uh, you know, according to their Euler equation. Um, so we know that output, uh, the output that household demand is one plus tau of theta, so is more than consumption, is one plus tau of theta times C. Uh, so households are always going to buy more uh, services than they actually consume because some of these services are used for recruiting. And so that's one plus tau of theta times. And so C, this is uh, given by the other equation that we've studied earlier. Uh, so it's one plus tau of theta times um, delta minus R divided by sigma prime zero Epsilon times one over one plus tau of theta uh, epsilon. Okay, uh, so y is going to be equal to delta minus r sigma prime of zero epsilon times one over one plus tau of theta epsilon minus one. And this relationship between output and tightness, which come from the demand side, we're going to call it yd, so it's going to be our aggregate demand, yd of theta. So this is the aggregate demand curve uh, that come from the, D, from the other equation. Um, so what are its properties? Well, a couple of things that we can see. Uh, yd at zero, so when the tightness is zero, the matching wedge is going to be zero, and so uh, aggregate demand is just going to be delta minus r divided by sigma prime of zero epsilon, so some positive number. The aggregate demand when the tightness is theta m, so when the tightness is theta m, the special tightness at which the matching wedge is infinite, if the matching wedge is infinite, so tau goes to infinity, tau, one plus tau to the power of epsilon minus one that goes to infinity, and so our aggregate demand is just zero. In general, though, what we find is that, so tau of theta, the matching wedge is increasing in tightness. Here it's put to the power of epsilon minus one, which is positive, and then put in the denominator. So the aggregate demand uh, is going to be decreasing with theta. And you know, otherwise it has uh, all the right properties, it's continuous and so on. Uh, so this is our aggregate demand curve. Now, uh, what is the solution of our model? So now we are quite familiar with uh, how we are going to solve this model. So first, the first step. So we, you know, uh, the tightness, is going to satisfy y is going to define implicitly by yd of theta is equal to ys of theta. So 
uh, uh, ys of theta is giving us the output when uh, unemployment is on the beverage curve and labor force, uh, you know, the labor force is given by the labor force uh, parameter. yd of theta gives us output when household uh, maximize their utility, subject their budget concern, and of course, both of these conditions have to be satisfied in the model. We know that households optimize, we know that the beverage curve always holds. So yd of theta and ys of theta, which this essentially comes from the from Euler, these come from the from beverage. So the output given by the beverage curve, the output given by the Euler equation, they both have to be true in the model. Uh, and so if we look at the intersection of aggregate of the and so this is AD and this is AS. If you look at the intersection of AD and AS, you'll get theta. And then from theta, you can back out uh, everything in the model as we're going to see. Uh, you can compute uh, all other variables. Exactly like we did, uh, it's no surprise. You know, it's exactly like we did in the static model. Once we have theta, we can figure out everything else. Um, so, you know, using using our standard uh, our standard relation. Um, so the key thing here is to look at the intersection of aggregate demand, aggregate supply to get tightness. Uh, so that's very easy. Given the work we've done, we can easily find theta. So let me uh, use a typical diagram. So let me have a, a zero here. Let me put theta, the market tightness, on the vertical axis. Let me put output on the horizontal axis. The maximum output that can be sold in the economy, we know that it's uh, A times H. H is the size of the labor force. A is the number of services provided by all workers. So that's the capacity. We know that the aggregate supply is looking something like this. From what we had done, and here what we've just found is that the aggregate demand. So uh, when theta is equal to theta m, it's equal to zero. And then otherwise, it's a decreasing function. And here we know that it has this value delta minus r divided by sigma prime of zero epsilon. Okay. And so here we can see one function is decreasing, one is increasing. Uh, and so we can see that they, they are always going to cross and they're going to cross exactly once. So what we learn from this is that uh, our model has a unique solution. This is the theta given by the solution and this is output given by the solution. That's a unique solution of the model. And of course, that solution always exists because these two curves, they always cross. Because uh, they, you know, one is decreasing, one is increasing. The, the demand starts above the supply when, uh, if you want, when uh, tightness equal to zero. And then, uh, so there'll always be uh, one intersection. One intersection will, uh, will be unique. Uh, so this is how you can find uh, how you can find theta here. And then once you have theta, so on the graph you can see a bunch of things. So for example here, this is a gap between output and the capacity of the economy. So this is you can immediately read idle capacity on the graph. Of course, idle capacity it's uh, idle capacity it's u the unemployment rate times a the productivity of worker times h, the size of the labor force, so it's proportional to the unemployment rate u. So when idle capacity moves around, you can also figure out what the unemployment rate uh, does. Uh, so you can also directly see that this is a model in which you always have some idleness. Oh, and the last thing you can do, that's kind of interesting. Um, so here we've, you know, We've computed our aggregate demand. We've uh, set up 
this key equation that determines implicitly tightness. We've plotted it, found that we have a unique solution. Another thing that you can uh, do with our diagram is that uh, you can decompose actually unemployment, which we've said is proportional to idle capacity, between a Keynesian component due to insufficient demand and a frictional component, which other models are not able to do. Because there are no other models out there that bring together aggregate demand and a matching process that capture like a, a frictional side of the labor, a labor market. So we have a Keynesian plus a frictional components. And here's how you can do that graphically. So I'm going to put my tightness here, I'm going to put output here, I'm going to put capacity here. So here, because I want to talk about uh, unemployment, you know, I can just, you know, if I take my aggregate demand and I divide it by A, the labor productivity, I take my aggregate supply divided by A, the labor productivity, um, I move from aggregate demand, aggregate supply, uh, instead of having them in units of services, I can have them in units of labor, right? So I can completely do that. Uh, so here, because labor and output are proportional, you know, since the production function is linear. So what I can do is I can put, instead of output, I can put um, employment, which is just output divided by A. And I can put H here, which is just the capacity divided by A. That's my labor force. So then I can have employment that shows up here. I can have... Uh, I can have a labor demand in the economy, LD, which is just the aggregate demand divided by A. I can have a labor supply in the economy, LS, which is just the aggregate supply divided by A. Once I do that, this is exactly, you know, it's exactly equivalent. It's just a representation in terms of employment instead of output. I still have my tightness that solves the model. I have my employment that uh, that we get as a result. But here, because I have the gap between employment and uh, the size of the labor force, here actually I, I can have directly the number of workers who are unemployed. And, uh, and I can have a decomposition of unemployment in the two components. So let me put here So here I have uh, total employment, and here so this here, this is employment. Employment is less than the labor force which we have here, so we have some unemployment in the model. Um, and you can see two things. So this amount here that this amount of um, unemployment, you can see that even if the so if the labor demand is vertical, you know the the only reason that the labor demand is uh, downward sloping here it's because of the matching wage, right? Uh, so you remember that the expression for the labor demand LD it's going to be delta minus R sigma prime of zero, one over epsilon, one over one plus tau of theta, epsilon minus one, and I guess divided by A. Uh, so if there was no frictions uh, in the model, so if the recruiting cost were uh, zero, the, lab the labor demand would look something like this.
So this vertical line here, this is a labor demand with a rho the recruiting cost equals zero and therefore tau the recruiting wage equals zero. So here it's when there are no recruiting costs. So if there are no recruiting costs, the labor demand, the aggregate demand, they are completely vertical. They don't depend on tightness. Of course, aggregate demand, labor demand, the only reason they depend on tightness is because they influence how difficult it is um, to buy services and to find workers. If the recruiting cost is zero, the dependence on tightness disappears. So you have a vertical, uh, you have a vertical curve like this. So this first component, the gap between the labor force and the labor demand without a recruiting cost, what's it caused by? Well, it's only caused by a lack of uh, aggregate demand in your economy. You know, if you have some unemployment when there are no recruiting costs, the only reason that you have unemployment is because there is not enough demand for labor. So this gap that we have here, this is Keynesian unemployment. The gap between the vertical labor demand and the labor force. That's due to a lack of aggregate demand. But then what we can see is that the actual unemployment rate is larger than this Keynesian unemployment. You have an additional component here. And this exists, as you can see, because the labor demand is not uh, vertical, but is downward sloping. So this extra component, it exists only because we have recruiting cost. Um, and in fact, when the recruiting costs are small, the labor demand is more vertical. This is a smaller extra amount of unemployment. When recruiting costs are large, the labor demand is flatter. This is a bigger amount of unemployment. So this extra amount of unemployment, it is frictional unemployment. It's really caused It's caused by the recruiting cost. Um, so now you can see you have these two uh, you have these two components of unemployment. You have the Keynesian side and the frictional side. And then when you have shocks, these two components you are going to move around. Uh, they are going to move around over the business cycle. So when you have a negative demand shock, you'll have more Keynesian unemployment and actually less frictional unemployment. And when you have a, a positive demand shock, that will reduce the Keynesian unemployment, but increase the frictional unemployment. And actually, this kind of interesting thing that frictional unemployment is small in bad times and big in good times, which is a bit counterintuitive. That was the topic of my job market paper uh, to show that, in fact, these frictions are relatively irrelevant in bad times, because if you have a big lack of jobs, although you have a rotating cost, it's very easy and when tightness is low, it's very easy to fill vacancies, so the recruiting costs become irrelevant, and the frictional component becomes very small. In good times, although you have a lot of jobs, uh, it's going to be hard to fill vacancies, and so these recruiting costs are going to become more relevant, and you can show that the frictional component of unemployment is going to be, uh, is going to be larger. Uh, 